This is a uh, joint work with Piotr de Goncha, uh, Veronica Penciokova and uh, Nick Sanders. And the usual uh, disclaimer uh, applies given uh, the central bank uh, co-authors. So what we would like to do in the paper is um, get at this question of COVID and firm failures. We know that COVID is an unprecedented shock in terms of its complexity, severity and unevenness. And this unevenness comes in, in several forms, in, 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 the, in terms of countries, in terms of sectors, firms, uh, the, the original intensity of the shock, uh, the later policy packages and, and, and so forth. But basically, there are going to be a lot of unevenness surrounding this shock. So small businesses are especially at risk for failure uh, with this shock because the shock is really not about a financial crisis, not like a dread shock balance sheet or anything like that. It's a shock to the income of the firms. Of course, this means small businesses are going to be uh, at risk more than large businesses. So here, of course, a typical example will be an airline versus uh, restaurants uh, in terms of many reasons. But I will I will explain in detail later on how we deal with huge heterogeneity in the data <clears throat> in this sense. And what is also important is not only the fact that small businesses, small medium enterprises, SMEs are uh, at you know, at a higher level of risk, um, there are going to be different policies applied in different countries uh, to support firms, right? Certain countries did uh, pandemic loans, very uh, uh, widespread in Europe. Other countries uh, did uh, direct cash grants, uh, waivers, rent and tax waivers. Um, so these different policies went on in different countries and different sectors at the same time with the economy-wide stimulus. All countries did fiscal and monetary stimulus uh, together with these um, also fiscal policies directed directly at the supporting the firms. So at this juncture, we would like to do several things. And I'm going to present mostly the, the paper in the program, COVID-19 and SME failures. Uh, but I will also show a few slides from the companion paper uh, titled 2021 Time Bomb. This is already in American Economic Review Papers and Proceedings. And the second companion paper we did for the Jackson Hole meeting of this year, just presented a few weeks ago, fiscal policy in the age of COVID, does it get into all of the cracks? Okay, let me just put the questions on the table. So we are going to start with the key question, what is the impact of COVID-19 on firm failures in a wide range of countries? We just don't want to focus on US or another country, but we would like to get a, a broad look at that. We, we are going to have a detailed look on government interventions because that's what happened in the real world. And we would like to understand cost and effectiveness of these government interventions specifically aimed at saving these firms. A lot of interventions were designed for SMEs. For example, PPP program in the U.S. only designed for SMEs. SMEs in the U.S. defined as firms less than 500 employees. So the third question is going to be, well, okay, we did so much. Uh, did we create a time bomb at the same time in terms of once the policy support, uh, uh, you know, is withdrawn, are we going to face this wall of bankruptcies in 2021? So we look at that question in the companion paper. Then we kind of took this whole thing broader in terms of what about aggregate activity? If fiscal policy is so successful in stimulating the aggregate activity, that also has to have the firms and you know prevent bankruptcies so we look at that in the jackson hole paper together putting this in a global context obviously different countries have different fiscal policy packages and a country like united states that spent trillions what are the effects globally and finally we are going to ask what are the implications of all this in a world of two speed recovery as we are living through right now the key reason of two speed recovery being global uneven vaccinations and we would like to understand kind of what is going on in the emerging market world uh, uh, in that sense. Okay, so let me go through the methodology. So the, the big challenge when you want to understand <clears throat> firm failures is not to have real time data. But let me just give you a, a little bit of background. Here. We started working on this paper April 2020. No way we can get real time data uh, on firm bankruptcy or firm exit. So people now think like, okay, we are in 2021, we should have this. Uh, the answer is no. I mean, let me first clear that firm filings come with two, two and a half year lag, okay? To get 
the the firm exit at, as as we know in a census data sense we have to wait at least until 2022 so we wouldn't know what actually happened in 2020 and 2021 without that data of course there is some bankruptcy data out there i'm sure you saw a lot of figures that shows no bankruptcy at all as of in 2020 as opposed to something like 2008 those of course the court filings right that data comes from the court filings which, if you think about it, not that meaningful during COVID. I mean, there were a lot of countries stop a moratorium on this, like Germany, uh, other countries, court process was super slow. So in real data sense, we really don't know from exit and from bankers. OK, so that means the challenge is to come up with a methodology that will help us to estimate that. That requires to estimate the liquidity shock. OK, so as I said, COVID is first and foremost is going to be a revenue shock, liquidity shock to firms' cash flow. So the, the trick is in this equation, in this slide, you see that come up with the orange. OK, so basically the color coding here works as everything green we can read from the data, uh, you know, prior to COVID, 2019 data, and everything orange, we have to come up with a methodology to estimate. OK, so the idea is here, combine, write down a very simple firm optimization model to estimate this. A CF COVID in orange, cash flow COVID, and combine that with the cash and financial expenses data we know from 2019. That's going to come from represent the firm level financial data from Orbis. So here we are going to start with 17 countries. So this, this paper we, we did first, as I said, we started April 2020. We want to do it obviously quickly. So we went with only 17 countries with very high quality data in Orbis, and that's going to be, of course, mostly European countries. Later for the Jackson Hole paper, we extended this to almost 30 countries. So I'm going to show you results with that. In that big, big sample, we are going to have a lot of emerging markets. So here we are only going to have two emerging markets. But the idea is to combine these firm level financial data with the model and to get at the second equation. So the cash flow COVID is going to be the, the, the shock, uh, which is this PUI uh, uh, had COVID. To the revenue. So here I wrote this as 2018. We updated with this 2019. Pretty much it's going to be the same thing. Basically, your entry balance sheet to COVID. And then we are going to have firms optimize in terms of minimizing the cost over labor and materials given the supply and demand shocks calibrated at the four-digit level. So a big thing in our in our work is calibrating the supply and demand shock at the four-digit sector level, uh, together with the added demand shock. Uh, so that's going to be very, very important. Okay, I mean the literature obviously very big, and I'm sure I'm forgetting papers here. This is this is not updated, uh, I think, uh, in a month. But uh, believe me, I mean you have to update this type of list every week now. So far, our difference from the literature is to combine the structure model with firm level data, and also to really try to measure the heterogeneity in failure rates, the effects of government support. Okay. So the methodology very simply is going to be, as I said, a simple firm uh, uh, minimization, uh, cost minimization problem. Firm I is going to be in sector S, okay, denoted as IS, who is going to be producing, there's a geosynthetic productivity, Z, capital, labor, N, and materials. And A is going to be a sector level uh, uh, productive variable. Firms within sectors are going to be selling differentiated varieties, very standard setup, nested CES demand structure, downward sloping. And we are going to use hot uh, hat algebra, right? There is nothing really dynamic here except this before after COVID. Okay, so we are going to do a one-time change denoted by hat, demand in normal times, DIS, demand under COVID, D prime IS. So everything D prime over D in the paper is going to be denoted as D hat. Okay, so that's the change in demand. And that is going to, of course, come from this aggregate demand shock, P times D, and the sectoral shifter demand shift okay and this orange again orange things are going to be estimated from the data and that's going to be a very important uh, part of the paper combining that firm level data the, the the firm level data that we have entering the COVID together with these COVID shocks that are very heterogeneous at the sector level and at the country level also when we you have many countries so the firm minimization problem is very straightforward. Uh, the, the, the trick is, of course, I mean, you know, without the second line, you are going to have just the standard textbook stuff uh, to introduce some sort of supply chain. OK, so this we believe is extremely important, especially when you start thinking about input output network, supply bottlenecks, 
uh, you know, demand normalizing, supply not normalizing, creating temporary inflation. All that stuff is going to be about these uh, sectoral supply constraints and how they relax, when they relax, and so forth. Okay. So we are going to try to do this as realistic as we can later on in this digital agenda. The original simple way we start is just introduce a labor, labor supply. Constraint. Okay. So the idea is here obviously you have a lockdown. Uh, and you know that's going to affect the, the labor supply in certain sectors. So when labor is not constrained, you are going to have your standard first order condition. And when labor is constrained, which you are going to assume with this X as hat thing, then you are not going to be able to uh, go to the optimal labor. Okay, and then your first order condition is going to be given by this uh, last equation on this slide. So how do we combine that with the uh, failure uh, criteria? We are going to define the operating cash flow as firm revenue, wages, call, wage costs, material costs, fixed costs, and taxes. Then we, we do everything in changes, right? Which is going to help us a lot to get rid of this fixed stuff. So we do everything before COVID and after COVID. So obviously we are going to assume these things don't change. Later we do robustness over that. But basically, when we calculate this change in cash flow, which is cash flow under COVID minus cash flow before COVID, it is going to be two equations again. When labor is not constrained, you have the standard stuff. And when labor is constrained, you have this third equation on the slide. And then business failure criteria is going to be very simple. It's a liquidity criteria. And basically, when your cash flow under COVID and your existing cash falls short of your financial expenses, you exit. Okay, so that's a very stark assumption. Later, we are going to relax the saying, well, you can borrow this gap from a bank or government obviously government support is exactly about closing that gap but as a start this is the, this is the criteria right so you fall off um uh, uh short in this type of uh, you know uh, liquidity gap you exit that's the criteria how do we take this to the data so we do a lot here uh in terms of labor utilization constraint we are going to separate essential sectors and non-essential sector this is becoming now standard in the literature using uh, Dingle Neiman on a data, the idea is here, uh, you know, so basically if you are in a non-essential sector, you are going to be able to do remote work. Uh, so this separation is going to depend a little bit on that feasibility of remote work. We do also other things on this uh, later on, but that's basically what it is. So essential sector, you are not going to have a labor supply constraint problem. Productivity shop, this, this is actually going to be very ad hoc. Uh, we are just going to adjust productivity of these remote people under COVID by 20%. And they are using data from ACS. Um, we did robustness around this. this. This doesn't matter that much. What is going to matter a lot is the sectoral shifters. Okay, the sectoral demand shock, sectoral supply shock, and then the aggregate demand shock. So I like the demand shock also to a certain extent, but sectoral stuff is going to be very more important because we have to get this relative uh, shifting right, right? Obviously, not every sector crashing in terms of demand. I mean, you are fearful of going to a restaurant, right? Your demand for consuming restaurant uh, product goes down, but of course, your demand for online grocery goes to the right. So that's what we are going to be capturing using again this physical proximity data, face to face interaction data, which is very high in a restaurant, very low when you order online to, to calibrate this sector of demand shifter. Aggregate demand shock, I mean, for lack of the better way of doing this, we are going to use growth forecast. We are fully aware of uh, the fact that this is going to have policy in it at some point, because obviously VO is going to update the forecast by incorporating policy. So we will deal with this later on by separately using things like Google Mobility Index, Lockdown Stringers Index, and all that in order to be able to separate uh, this aggregate demand flow. But as a start, we are just going to use these uh, IMF forecasts. And everything is sector. When I say sector, that's four digits, uh, NASNA. What are the limitations of this approach? I mean, we, we believe this is a very useful approach, but of course, of course there are limitations. So this is a liquidity criterion, right? As, as I explained, uh, we are going to declare bankruptcy when that firm, that small firm is going to fall short of cash. Okay. Uh, what is What are we missing in solvents, right? There were a lot of, uh, debate on this insolvency thing, um, which is, by the way, it was always the case in every crisis, but if it's a financial crisis, of course, you come to the point of insolvency very quickly because that's a balance sheet weakness and we always think about that right away. 
This is not a financial crisis. This is a revenue shock. But obviously, at some point, a firm that is not going to be able to pay its debt is going to be insolvent. So that <laughs> definition is going to require us to think about negative equity. So that's going to be very difficult when you work with private firms. Uh, we are focusing on SMEs. Our sample is basically almost not, but it's going to be less than 1% of the sample that there are going to be listed SMEs. The SMEs are going to be private firms. They are not listed on the stock exchange. That means it's very hard to calculate a, a market value, a negative equity uh, mark to mark. Okay. And also, <laughs> I mean, it is definitely a limitation, but it may not be uh, that detrimental because we know that SMEs access is limited, even normal times, right? SME access is limited to financial markets in normal times, let alone a shock like COVID. Uh, although we are going to look, do a lot of robustness on this later on. Okay, the other limitation is this is very static. Perfect prices, perfect real wages, it's completely demand-driven output. And remember, uh, there is no dynamics here, no states variable, a first round effect estimation, so you do a little, little one-time change, like relative to non-COVID, what happens under COVID. So that's the first paper. Uh, later on, we are going to relax this. We are going to assume flexible prices, still rigid wages in the Jackson Hole paper, together with input-output network. The price adjustment is going to be extremely important once you have an input-output network, because in an input-output network economy, the demand changes is going to affect the marginal cost and the price, and that's going to have an effect on the supply changes in, in downstream and upstream sectors. So that we do in detail in the in the Jackson Hole paper. And calibration of shock, as I said, uh, we do our best to really separate the sectoral demand and sectoral supply shock. An aggregate demand shock as an aggregate demand shock, but of course, they are going to be linked to each other. And especially the aggregate demand one, it's going to be linked to policy interventions. Remember, I told you we use the forecast. As I said in the in the later paper in the Jackson Hole paper, we are going to use Google Mobility and lockdown stringency to be able to separate these uh, further. Okay, so let me show you our uh, measurement of the supply and demand shock. So the color coding here is that the orange sectors are the essential sectors and the most essential sectors, and the dark blue are the non-essential sectors. I'm sure you see a picture similar to this now that you see this huge crash, let's look at demand you know, on the demand side, on the on the right, in sectors like entertainment and recreation, accommodation and food services, wholesale and retail, and then you see this increase in demand in more essential sectors and sectors such as, uh, you know, construction, you know, people started doing a lot of home renovations and so forth. The supply shock is going to be all negative, of course, minuscule in essential sectors such as base and electricity and transportation, but it's going to be huge. In, in sectors such as uh, accommodation and food mining, of course, because remember, a big part of the supply shock we measure from the labor supply constraint linked to the uh, lockdowns. Okay. Given this, what is the baseline failure rate? When I say baseline failure rate, there is going to be some assumption behind that. Eight-week lockdown, we are going to assume a single eight-week lockdown for all the countries. Later, we do different things around here. Most importantly, no government intervention. The reason why we do this is because we would like to understand how successful the policy is, right? I mean, yes, in the real world, of course, this didn't happen, but is it really because of the policy or other things? So we want to understand in the absence of government intervention, what would have uh, happened, right? So uh, that's what we do in the baseline. As I said, we are going to use 17 countries on the two emerging markets. It's going to be mostly European countries. U.S. is not here because U.S. is not going to have this type of uh, very detailed financial balance sheet data on, on SMEs. Well, they do, but it's, it's confidential data set from Fed, and obviously we cannot use that in this paper. Um, we are going to be reporting cumulative rate at the end of 2020. We are doing a weekly calculation, right? It's going to be extremely important because, uh, you know, that week you fall off cash, you are deemed failing. Uh, obviously, you can smooth that out around the year. Um, so, which we are going to allow firms to do later on, saying, you know, borrowing from a bank and all that. But here, we just calculate this week by week, and then we show you the cumulative uh, rate at the end of the year. And this is the aggregate rate is going to mask a lot of heterogeneity. But in terms of the aggregate, and the difference here in the first line and the second line in the table is the high coverage uh, country, meaning we have almost all the SMEs, financial positions in those countries, and all 17 countries. It's not going to make that much of a difference. So basically, you are going to have, if you see on the slide third column, a nine percentage point increase in the bankruptcy rate. Okay. Remember, we do everything in Delta. 
uh, that is going to help us a lot to, uh, you know, um, basically uh, difference out the things that we ignore, the model ignores in normal times, in a normal time business exit. Uh, so the difference what matters, because those things are also going to be under the COVID and they are going to be different self. But basically, if you want to know the COVID failure, 18% of the firms are going to be failing SMEs. These are SMEs. And the increase in it going to be a nine percentage point increase in the bankruptcy. But as I said, this is going to mask a lot of heterogeneity. Why heterogeneity? Heterogeneity is going to come from two sources, sectoral intensity of the shock and the initial balance sheet position the firms enter to COVID, right? So in terms of sectoral heterogeneity, obviously the, the change in the bankruptcy is going to be huge for sectors like entertainment and recreation, accommodation and food, as you see in the first two dark blue uh, bars here. So they are going to be as high as 25 percentage point increase. This is the delta, right? So the, the level of bankruptcy is much higher of these sectors. Again, this doesn't happen in real world because this is in the absence of policy intervention. So huge increase in these sectors that is going to hit a lot by the both the demand shock, fear of going out and the supply shock, right, the lockdown, as opposed to essential sectors, that's going to be very little. In, in the electricity sector, the bankruptcy is going to be something like only two percentage point increase. Now, in terms of country heterogeneity, I'm not showing you all the countries, some countries, but a country like Italy is going to experience a much higher increase in the bankruptcy rate, almost a 15 percentage point increase as opposed to Czech Republic. That's solely coming from, I mean, not solely, but mostly coming from the, the balance sheets from enter. If you enter with very big, big balance sheets of the crisis, like Italian firms, that's what's going to face. But it also comes from the fact that con sectoral composition of each country and the, the input output compositions actually can be quite different. This is something we realized when we were doing the other paper, uh, especially there is a big difference between emerging markets and advanced economies. I will tell you, but here, the heterogeneity in this figure is going to be coming a lot from um, the, the initial uh, balance sheets of the firms in these countries. Okay. Okay. So this is the basic setup in, in, in the first paper. Uh, I would like to tell you what happens uh, when you add the IO network and flexible prices and policy support in the, in the uh, remaining time, because this is going to be actually extremely important. Okay, let me first show you the aggregate failure rate. Remember, I showed a nine percentage point increase overall in the in the previous setup when prices are rigid and there's no I. Okay. What is happening here is prices are flexible now, wages are still rigid, okay, and there is IO. So there is a uh, IO uh, network linking uh, the, the, the firms and the sector. Extremely interestingly, I have the same number. We were very surprised at this. I mean, how, how can it be? Because obviously we are expecting an amplification coming through the IO network. And there is amplification coming through IO network, don't get me know. But there is a reduction coming through an extensive margin. Okay. So um, obviously I missed the, the, the morning presentation, but I'm sure this came up during the papers in the morning. So once you add the flexible prices and the IO network, we are going to allow an extensive margin which means when firms exit, the demand is going to be allocated among the surviving firms. Okay, that is going to act as a reduction in failure rate, while IO is going to act as an amplifier on the failure rate. So overall, we are going to end up with a similar average nine percentage point increase in the, in the failure rate across all the countries. Now we also have expanded the set of the countries. Instead of 17, we have 27 countries here I'm showing you. 18 advanced economies, again, going to, mostly going to be European, nine emerging markets. And here, the big difference is going to be uh, from uh, that advanced economies versus emerging markets. Even overall, the increase in the bankruptcy in the absence of policy is going to be nine percentage point increase. It's much lower in advanced economies, 5.6 percentage point, much higher in emerging markets, 12.5 percentage point. And that is the detailed out in the, in the Jackson Hole paper solely coming from the IO structure, emerging markets interestingly have a lot of source concentration. So their input use is really concentrated from other sectors. So the amplification effect is very important there as opposed to advanced countries. Okay, so that's, that's the difference. But overall, we are going to report a nine percentage point increase uh, in bankruptcy. Okay, I think I have, uh, let me see, 10 minutes left. Okay. Let me talk about the policy support. I don't have much time to talk in detail 
but in uh, in the first paper, we did a lot of um, kind of hypothetical support. I mean, we did a pandemic loan, but we didn't use uh, the you know application of actual policies for every country. We use kind of an ECB formula since in the original paper, most countries are European and we work the effects of that. In the second paper, we did the same, but now we also brought real life policies, meaning not all of them, but mostly used ones, pandemic loans, cash grants, a lot of countries did cash grants and waivers, waivers being tax and rent waivers, okay? Results are going to be the same in terms of very simple conclusion, even numbers are very close, that policy <coughs> did reduce bankruptcy a lot, okay? Again, no policy support, you have a nine percentage point increase in the failure rates, there's the, the discrepancy across advanced emerging markets, but overall nine percentage points. Hypothetical cost of the policy, and that's the advantage of having the model, here we can go and say exactly the firm's failing, right? You can do a surgical operation, I mean, it is, it is, which is what we call targeted bailouts. I mean, you, you are saving exactly who is failing. That's super low. Okay. So that's going to be 0.8% of the GDP. Okay. That, of course, that's not a real life number. Uh, in real life, we are going to use the actual funds dispersed. Okay. And again, don't look at this number as, oh, it is much higher than that. That's because you are thinking about the fiscal, po fiscal package. When you think about like a 15% of GDP fiscal po package number, that is everything, right? Here it is on the pandemic loans and then the cash grants and then the uh, waivers. So that's going to be around 6% of GDP in advanced countries, around 2% in, uh, in emerging markets overall, 4% of GDP are the funds dispersed, right? Again, very important. I'm not saying this is the cost of policy because some of this is going to be paid back in, because they are pandemic loans. This is the funds dispersed. Now, that type of disbursement is actually super, super successful, I mean, it's actually negative. Bankruptcy rate change is negative in advanced uh, economies. So basically, you are doing better than normal business cycle exit. That's what minus 0 0.43 is telling you. That is going to come fully from this gigantic size of the, the support in, in uh, advanced economies. It's just going to be a lot, a lot. Full offset in advanced economies, uh, obviously not in emerging markets still. Even not that much funds dispersed in emerging markets, the, the support, direct support to firms is way more limited in emerging markets. Still, the bankruptcy rate is going to be reduced from something like 12% change to 9% change. Okay. Uh, so, so that's an important conclusion. So the policy targeting firms is overall successful, success here in terms of reducing the failure rate. It doesn't mean this is an efficient policy, uh, good or bad policy, nothing like that. This is just like a uh, you know, positive result, no normativeness here in terms of what happened to the failure rates. Failure rates declined, they basically zero, they become zero in advanced economies and emerging markets, they decrease. Unfortunately, they are not efficient policies, right? They were very poorly targeted. So we calculate the firms at risk, and jobs at risk, okay? And remember, funds disperse is around 5% of GDP, 36% of the at-risk firms saved, and 47% of at-risk jobs saved. So not all of it, right, obviously. Uh, and, uh, you know, so obviously, you know, a, a decent fraction of the vulnerable firms saved, but not all. Plus, there is going to be money going to firms who don't need it. The, the silver lining here is that there is no zombification. So a lot has been written on this zombification, a lot of zombie firms, a lot of zombie firms. Most of it is, I think, just perception because of the previous financial crisis. And in general, that <coughs> during financial crisis, I think it is important that we understand this is not a financial crisis. Uh, and uh, that, that whole thing is not going to be that straightforward just because you are giving money to firms or you are giving them extra debt. That doesn't mean you are zombifying the economy. We actually, of course, some of the zombie firms are going to get the money. That's that's for sure, but it's very little. We find that only 2% of the, all the funds dispersed went to zombies. Only 13% of the firms at risk are zombies, okay? Uh, these are the firms that are going to fail without support. Uh, among that group, this many zombies. And zombie here is going to be defined as, as usual based on an ICR, interest coverage ratio criteria. Also, we find that in 2021, when you uh, basically take 
the policy support away, meaning you start uh, making people pay back the pandemic loans and stop applying waivers and uh, sort of those things, you're not going to have that much of an increase in the bankruptcy rate. Only 2.6 percentage points relative to normal times. Even firms start paying their pandemic loans. Of course, the repayment uh, on this is super, super uh, easy. Most of the programs actually don't even ask you to repay. I mean, PPP, for example, in US, if you keep your employment, it's a grant. It, it, come, it turns into a grant. So in that sense, the, the, the terms are, of course, very easy. Still, you know, uh, that, that's what has an effect. Basically, most state firms are wide. Okay. All right. In terms of the risk to banking sector, of course, this result follows the previous result. If not that money, if not that much money went to some firms, that means there is not going to be that many non-performing loan problems as we have seen in previous financial crises, right? So this uh, analysis that looks at the banking sector, unfortunately, is only going to be for these countries. Belgium, Finland, France, Germany, Spain. Why? Because we need uh, not only the, the, uh, the, the banks, firms linked, the share of the, the loans on those bank balance sheet and then link it back to the, the set one ratio, but basically using data from these countries on the banks and the firms, we find that this uh, risk-weighted capital ratio, which is basically what we look at for a systemic risk analysis to the banking sector, it only declines two percentage points, 2.12 percentage point. So that you start with 14 percent risk weighted ratio, set one ratio at the beginning of COVID. This is the banking system in these countries. And the decline because of these non-performing loans given to SMEs are only going to be two percentage points. OK, so that's actually very, very small. And to tell you that how small that is, uh, there was a, a stress test scenario, adverse stress test scenario run, run by EBA, European Banking Authority in 2018. Their adverse scenario suggests a four percentage point decline. Okay, so you have to go to 10 from 14 to 10. We only find there's two percentage point decline. Of course, a lot is about starting with 14, right? This is the success of banking regulation introduced after 2009. If you look at these levels, set levels entering the 2009 crisis, of course, they are much lower. So a decrease in two percentage point can be very serious. But if you start with something like 14 percent, thanks to that regulation, when you enter roll uh, and enter COVID, then this is not systemic risk. A two-person point decline is not systemic risk of the banking sector. Okay. What about 2021? I mean, is it does it mean that everything is very good? No, everything is not very good, of course. But it, it doesn't mean that when we uh, pull the policy support, there is going to be a time wall. We actually show that even you repay the loans uh, you got over five years, and most of the pandemic loans, as I said, either for given turn into a grant, if you keep employment, or they are repaid over five years, that's fine. Nothing is going to go wrong, except there is a financial market panic. Okay, which means is now banks are not going to roll over their existing debt. Don't forget that firms enter this crisis with existing debt, right? And then we think about when we say policy support withdrawn, we are thinking about you know uh, governments are stop doing waivers, they are requiring payment on the pandemic loans and all that. But there is an existing debt, short term debt, that as these firms entered, banks did roll over that debt which is something that they couldn't do during 2008, 2010 period, because that was a financial crisis. So we work out that if that happens for some reason, I don't know, <coughs> I don't know tomorrow morning we are going to wake up to the news that none of the vaccines are working. There is a Delta square times, you know, lambda variant, and all bets are off. So if there's some sort of financial market panic because of a lot of uncertainty, then of course there's going to be a, a cascading wall of bankruptcies because that means existing debt is not being rolled over. Okay. So final thing I want to say in one minute is what happens in a global setting, okay? In a global setting, we are going to take very seriously global trade and production network. Here I'm showing you a picture of this to you. On the left, it is, uh, you know, the country linkages. Um, so there's going to be um, color coding here in terms of more open countries, more blue, less open countries, less blue. Size of the boxes are going to be the size of the countries. Thickness of the, the, the bars are going to be the trade and uh, input output linkage is strength between countries. So there are going to be uh, 65 countries, 35 industries. This is uh, over 2000 by 2000 metrics. And on the right, there is the sector one. And the same thing, dark red sectors are very open sectors like computer electricity, uh, light pink are less so like construction wholesale, but it doesn't matter really if you're a sector open to trade or not. As long as you have this sort of linkages in terms of who is sourcing uh, from who, uh, it is going to be important 
uh, what type of COVID shock, which sector <coughs> is forced to, and how this is going to be trickled down between sectors and between countries. Okay. So using this, we are going to ask uh, now kind of broader questions, not only the fact that if fiscal policy provide enough support to SMEs, now considering IO linkages and price adjustment, but also in terms of what about supporting the aggregate activity, what about global scores, and what does it mean in terms of to speed recovery? Here we also find again, even with IO networks and price adjustment, there are still going to be less SME failures thanks to policy support and without creating zones, okay? It is going to be wasted, there is going to be wasted money because a lot of the money is going to go to firms who didn't need it, but still overall, the bankruptcy rates are going to be reduced. Very important result here is that fiscal policy is going to be reallocate demand towards sectors with slack, sustainable overall employment, but that doesn't mean it is something successful globally, right? It is not going to lift all the time. So the fact that US spending trillion is not going to be useful for all the countries. And of course, moving forward, there's going to be strong financial headwinds for emerging markets because of this possible increase in global interest rates, uh, you know, initiated by increasing inflation because of these supply bottlenecks and also differential risk premia across two sets of countries. Okay, let me uh, skip these slides. I can come back to these uh, later if um, there are questions. Let me conclude since I'm out of time. So basically the result from you know, the first paper and then like two subsequent papers we added is uh, overwhelmingly the case that policies prevented from failures. They didn't create zombies. However, there is going to be waste as most funds went to firms who didn't need it. SME fundamentals are now strong and they don't need additional support. This is going to actually tell us that we should start dialing back the fiscal support. The multipliers from fiscal transfers are going to be small. That's going to be a lot because of supply constraint, the bottleneck issue and the IO linkages. Cross-border spillovers are also going to be small. So this is saying everybody's fiscal policy is for themselves, which means if you spend trillions versus nothing and advanced economy emerging market difference, there are going to be extreme differences uh, in different countries and actually spillovers are going to be beggar than neighbor. That is purely a result of the nature of the COVID shock and the IO linkages. Finally, this uneven vaccination and different sides of fiscal packages, different helps the firms and the aggregate economy in general, is going to lead to this to speed recovery. That's going to create a lot of uh, problems for emerging markets down the road in terms of rising global rates and differential risk premium. So overall conclusion is we have to taper fiscal fast, uh, but we have to be slow and communicate clearly our monetary taper. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the organizer for um, reminding me to, uh, to discuss this paper. And also, of course, for the, of the authors of the very fascinating, you know, complete uh, research agenda. Um, so, I mean, I think the motivation of the work is very clear. Now we are living in a very unprecedented crisis in the depth, but in the scope of the nature of the crisis, and that trigger an unprecedented and very strong and fast uh, policy response of whatever it takes, right? Um, and one important thing at that time, as given the, all the the impact of the sanitary measures and um, one important preoccupation of academics and everybody thought it was going to happen to especially small business that was hit by this, this shock, I mean by this income shock as Pastor Dave has um, correctly uh, defined it, and so the world is measured for the Now looking back, there's been some times if that happened, uh, there's a lot of questions floating around. Did this support to small business work? That's one question. Did it was efficiently? So what we did work. Can we do it better? Can we do it better next time? Hopefully, there's going to be an exam. And there are other uh, questions, like for example, what's going to be the outcome when, when, once, once we, we are out of the, the pandemic, pandemic going, going out, out and scaling, scaling back, back on this? So, so the, the paper, paper is trying to answer all these questions using a quantitative model populated with different level data. So it's very, very, as you saw, it's a very, very applied exercise trying to provide numbers and evaluating policies, unlikely scenarios, also that will help us trying to design policies to out of the, of the pandemic. So, sorry. Uh, just one second. As you saw, this is not a paper, but this is really a very rich agenda that's been going on for a couple of years or one and a half years now. So the first paper has put uh, was very early 2020, trying to use the data the best 
that they can, as I was explaining today. Then it's a second follow-up of the first paper, um, which was called the Time Bomb paper that was already presented here. And then lastly, the last part of the agenda is a Charcot Hall paper two weeks ago, where the model, the firm model that was presented today, is extended a little bit, and data is added for nine emerging economies, which gives this very interesting uh, contrast between rich, I mean emerging and, and, and economies. And the Jackson Hole paper has also different chapters. We'll look a bit like other papers because they're, they're complementary, using basically a, dynam a dynamic, general equilibrium model of the global economy, trying to look at whether there were sp uh, international spillovers from the aggressive fiscal policies, in, um, especially in advanced economies to emerging economies, uh, what will happen to financial conditions <coughs> for, um, for emerging economies in the future. So very quickly on the model, so basically the idea, the, the approach is to build a stylized, yet rich model that can capture what we now, after some time since the, the, the start of the crisis, economies believe or are the consensus of what describes the crisis, right? So that means there are both demand and supply shocks, aggregate demand shocks, but also relative across sectors, and also supply shocks in terms of productivity or labor supply. These shocks come from policies. These shocks can come, can come also for changes in preferences of the agents and so on, but everything is, is captured in, this, in these shocks in the paper. A very nice thing also the paper that, that is in the Jackson Hall uh, version but not before, as I explained today, is that the paper adds an in, um, input add with structure with complementarity in production. Basically, I thought that was a nice, very nice contribution of this paper because as we've seen, I mean, all the morning we, we were referring to these papers, you know, the were ready and the Bakai papers that put in this idea that uh, product, you know that you can have super shocks in some sectors and that can create uh, demand shortages and other ones. But so far, these ideas were more conceptual or abstract. And this paper tried to put it here and put it into quantitative model with numbers. So I think that's a, that's a nice, like it's, it's kind of an aside contribution, but very interesting. So to this model, that I'm not going to go into the details. The other firm exit rule based on a liquidity criteria. And therefore, combining this, they can say, <coughs> and they can calculate the number of firms per country, per sector that will be they decide to exit. Then they calibrate the model using sector level shocks that become sector country level using, you know, my high frequency data on lockdowns and so on. So I, was, I thought that was also a clever way of, of having some country sector variation. And then they use Orbis uh, balanced data when they have all this machine then they evaluate basically three policies, at least in, <coughs> in the version. So I, I, I read the version in the Jackson Hall paper because I thought that uh, you know, is the most complete one. And here, they exactly, they look at taxes, waivers, cash, or government uh, warranted loans. So the main results, again, these are from the last papers. First of all, COVID created, as I said before, an increase in failure rates, right? Uh, we, we knew that, but it's very nice to have, start having numbers on this. And they calculate that the failure rate increased nine points uh, in a scenario of COVID and non-COVID. And of course, with a much more uh, effect on emerging economies. This was already said. Now, did policy work? Yes, because calculations show that it reduced uh, failures to 0.3%, so less than half. However, if you have a sort of a cost-benefit analysis, the policies, especially in, 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 in advanced economies, uh, it was too expensive, right? So big numbers. Numbers are big, but I think this has to be taken as, as bounds, right? So uh, um, of, of the, you know, both, like the actual and the other. <coughs> I'm sorry. Then there are a couple of sorts of uh, other results, so there, there was not a time bomb. Basically, we're not, when we started scaling back these loans, we're not going to see a uh, um, you know, huge increase in failures. And also, there's a new result that was presented today, which was of interest to that this will not propagate to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the banking system. And there's no risk of zombification of the economy. And there are also another um, results that were presented now a bit quickly from the global model that you know, basically it's saying that Every country has to do its own stimulus. And, and also that there are dangers to emerging economies from potential increases in rates when 
can't, when you know they have this stupid speed recovery where rich countries are vaccinating and getting back on track and not uh, poor countries, right? <coughs> so, no. So basically, just before the comments, so this is a very thorough and deep agenda. So basically, most of my comments are things that, you know, when I was reading the papers come out of probably things that one can take out of this research to, you know, in the future. Because when you read an agenda like this, so there's one paper, there are some issues with it, and the next paper solves it, and the next paper solves it. That also is something sort of, uh, so maybe one way is to think about what is the next um, step. So I thought that the, and that was discussed today, so in the, big, in the first model, which was in 2020, there's no, there were not IO linkages. I think they're very important because, I mean, since, okay, to me, okay. Yeah, so I'm gonna go fast. <laughs> since the crisis, there's a lot of talk of, you know, how supply disruptions, how closings uh, in some parts of the production chain will spill down to other firms and so on. So, th so it's important, I think, that the model in COVID uses that. Um, one thing that, and it, so the exit effect in this, they have like positive effects in the sense that they liberate um, demand for others. But you know, one can think of also different uh, um, propagation effects. They are, they are discussed a little bit in a paper. Basically, you know, when you have less variety, so of the potential um, intermediate good, how that can propagate to the, to the production chain. So that, when also automatically things on all the literature, you know, like firm to firm trade and, you know, how, for example, failures in one part of the supply chain can propagate. Now, if you, the, I think the interest of this paper is that you have a data for a lot of countries. And if you want to have something more detailed at the production network, you could look at, you know, for example, uh, detailed uh, case studies, right? And then when you look at, Post-pandemic scenarios, I think, uh, looking also at the possibility of entry, as was uh, discussed this morning, is also would be an interesting point. I mean, I think for the short run, in the shock, we only care about exit, but in a more medium-term progression, what will matter, as was discussed today, is rather net entry or exit, right? Then, of course, the, I mean, I guess my suggestion here is to bridge the two models, right? The model of field failures and the international model will not failure to also have some idea of how trade linkages, but because it's, it's, it's a lot of people are thinking about, you know, supply, trade, supply chain restructuring to COVID and so on. Especially there's a lot of European countries here and European countries are very much entrenched in, in, in value chains. And also I thought that it was interesting that the IO structure creates strong effects for China because of high concentration, but we know at least there's a lot of discussion that the whole economy is too concentrated on China and India, so that gives hints of, of putting that. You can have a sort of a network approach using trade data as, as in, a company, in another research also by Semnem and Kowato. I think it was very nice the fact that in the general equilibrium you can identify which sectors are, are supply and demand constraints. And so that would be nice also to look at, to cross failures with that. And I think that's also like a nice byproduct of, of the analysis. And just a small point on, on the rigid situation, but I can, in the interest, I have one minute, I, I skip that for a second. So about the empirics, again, I mean, I think you are aware of the limitations uh, that you're gonna have. I mean, you have this data, you are trying to do the most again, but now there are some studies that use this particular, uh, for, at least for some countries. So the, the bounds that you give, it might be overestimated, mistargeting if there is a selection that was a bit better in practice, right? But you, that you can also know it exposed. So, and you, can, you will not be able to do it with your data, but you could like, and also the role of feeding heterogeneity has been documented, was mentioned this morning. It's impossible to do that for the countries, but maybe creating some scenarios could help too. And similarly for the failure condition, which I think is, is completely reasonable to work like this, uh, but again, giving some, uh, some, some scenarios on this would be nice. Um, again, we would like to know what are the country characteristics that lead some countries to have more, more or less failure. Is it sector composition, is policy, is institutions, and so on, and same for sector. Do we see more failures in supply or demand constraint and how these this interact together? And that's just one little bit point that I think is completely 
uh, valid to look at, at small firms, but it's true that big, big firms, especially very big firms, also receive a lot of aid. For example, in France, 20, 45 firms receive, uh, just once it's been with it, receive 20% uh, of all government loans, right? And when just, and when we are looking basically at the, if, if I may, well, I can I can show the graph, but if I, when we're looking at the export data, we saw that the big fall in export was mostly explained by a handful of very big firms, right? So this is only for the export market. I don't know what happened in the internal market, but I'm pretty sure that some things like this went, went down. So what this shows, that would be like another research question, but it maybe it's very interesting to know also because this granular, granularity, how that is playing when you have to design uh, these, these policies. So overall, it's a fascinating, very ambitious research. It's very timely, very targeted. It was very influential. I know it was followed closely by the authorities, in our bank at least. It's a great bridge between academic rigor and policy research. And it's exactly the type of product that institutions like ours like. And the tools could be developed further to help more monitoring and policy decisions. That's it. Okay, thank you, Juan. So hoping that Actually, I have two clarification questions. The first, the first one is about the, the exit criterion. So, as I understand, in the first, at least in the first paper, it was uh, based on liquidity shortage. And I was wondering, uh, when you move uh, to, um, to the policy uh, support, whether this is uh, still uh, um, valid, because uh, on top of fiscal support, there was an extensive distribution of uh, state uh, guaranteed loans. So basically, there was no liquidity uh, constraint during the crisis. So there will be one after the crisis, depending on the maturity, uh, especially on the maturity of these loans. So I was wondering uh, how you, you take this into account. And my second question is, is about uh, international networks. Uh, here I am a bit confused uh, because um, there are two interpretations that obviously uh, go, go in opposite directions. The first one is that given that the spreading of the pandemic uh, uh, was not, uh, was sequential, and it's still sequential because today, uh, uh, so, so for instance, between uh, the northern uh, hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, but also between uh, America, uh, Europe, uh, and Asia, it's not at the same time that we have the lockdowns. Hence, in, the, in this uh, situation, that we have an amplification effect of uh, uh, input-output um, disruptions um, because of bot bottleneck uh, effects. But at the same time, you could argue just the opposite, um, because the recovery is so uh, well spread now. We see uh, the huge uh, bottleneck of, on semiconductors. So now I'm a bit confused about the role of international uh, input-output networks on the, um, on the amplification uh, or mitigation of uh, the effect of the crisis itself and the recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Shebnam. So nice uh, seeing you online. Um, I know that you also have uh, another like uh, research like looking at the type of uh, support. So I was wondering whether you could actually like uh, incorporate this. In so there was a lot of discussion, right, on whether like uh, loans versus like equity participation. Mm -hmm. So now we are saying that uh, support was good. Uh, we are not going to have like uh, exits. Does the matter? So, so does the type of support matter for uh, for these results, or, or or it doesn't uh, at the end of the day? Thanks. Okay, one last question. Uh, hi, Sebnem. Uh, very quick question on the systemic risk uh, result. You said that uh, it's. Uh, it's unlikely to be huge, and that would be also partly because uh, of the uh, post-2008 regulatory uh, interventions. Uh, I was wondering whether, in, in actually, in your model, this turns out that uh, it's driven by a better uh, match between uh, more productive firms and credit, or is more uh, cash flow uh, 
uh, intensive firms uh, being more matched with credit, uh, how exactly this, this, this uh, reduced risk uh, would, would, would go, would work? So thank you so much. Um, these are great questions. Let me start um, with my discussion, Juan. Thanks so much. Um, I pretty much agree with everything uh, you said. Um, these are exactly the next stages we think about. I mean, I if you really want to do justice to empirical measurement of the whole IO story, it has to be firm to firm. I fully agree. I mean, we were just scratching uh, the base here and um, I mean, this is actually uh, has a different meaning for me. So the, the last conversation I had with Emmanuel before he was passed away was exactly on this, on the Baki Fari framework and how can we do this in an empirical setup with the global uh, framework. Um, I, I think it is super, super important. Uh, and we are just starting to appreciate the importance of this. So it has to be done firm to firm, plus the complementarity has to be full-fledged in. So in the in the first part of the Jackson Hole paper and in the first paper, when we do the domestic IO, we do go with the sigma less than one. We, we full-fledged use that complementarity as in those frameworks, Carvalho paper, Atalai paper, Baki and Fari paper. But when we go to the global model in the Jackson Hole paper, we unfortunately go back to Cobb Douglas because otherwise, uh, I mean, so far, we couldn't solve it uh, with, with Sigma less than one. So this is a hugely important research area. And I know many of you in this room is working on this. So I think both on the theory side and, and the empirical side, I think we have a lot to do. But definitely, we have to do it firm to firm. Going to your other comments, that will also allow us to do the firm shocks better, uh, the you know linking to the bank shock better. I mean, you mentioned the VAT data. So clearly, we don't have that we have good data in this uh, in all these papers, but it is only at the firm side, right? I mean, just single firm side. We don't have as good as the data of the French data, for example, that Agnes is using. Where you know you can link firms to firms and firms to banks, uh, and it would be amazing to make use of that data. Uh, so we didn't do any of that, but that's those are definitely the next uh, steps that will allow to. Uh, solve those remaining issues and answer those even bigger questions that, that you raised. In terms of uh, large firms, uh, I fully agree. I mean, large firms clearly got help, uh, but at the same time, they draw a lot on their credit lines. Um, not sure exactly the numbers in France, but in US at least, now there are several papers uh, using uh, both the PPP program data, which is only for small firms, and then other programs for large firms and also what large firms did in terms of their bank finance, um, they pretty much smoothed most of the shock through financial markets. So we told originally we just want to focus on SMEs and if we combine these two, we, it has to, it, it requires a more complicated setup, right? You have to separate the government support to small, large, financial market support to small, large. So I'm very important. I'm not saying it isn't. And clearly what you showed for export is very important, but this is this is the next round. But I, I fully agree. Okay, let me clarify the, the question. So Agnes' question, the, the policy support. Okay, so exit criteria, let me be very clear. Exit criteria in the model is always the liquidity criteria. Okay. And when we do the policy support, we go and see based on that exit that the vulnerable at-risk firm. What is policy doing? Okay. Now, we, in that sense, of course, policy is, you know, saving those firms or not, but policy, we don't have the data like you do. And I, I, this is this amazing French data. And I just saw a report, uh, you know, written by Benoit Cru and colleagues at the BIS using this data where you guys can match the support directly to the firm and, you know, the take up, right? So this is very important. And right now, I think Federal Reserve co-authors and San Francisco Fed co-authors doing the same exact thing for PPP program. So we don't have that. So we don't have the policy taken up. Uh, so the policy offered to Shepnam's firm and Agnes firm, and let's say I take it up fully and you didn't. So we don't have that data, right? So what we do uh, in the, uh, the Jackson Hole paper, then we use actual policies on, on government guarantee, pandemic loans, waivers and grants and all that. We do an equal take up and we just apply to all, right? So in that sense, we cannot get at that, oh, this firm got the full support, this firm, because that's that's real-time data that you know we didn't have. Remember, the whole point of this is, okay, let me do a model 
Let me estimate the failure rate based on the security criteria from that model. And then let me see what happens when I apply this, you know, three type of post support broadly to offer. I mean, we, we realize this is at all, I and mean, obviously it would be much better to do it with real life data because take up is not the same and all that sort of things. And not everybody got the same type or the amount of the help. But again, remember the exercise is to uh, help policymakers to decide when they are designing this program before we know all this, right? So, you know, how effective we are and how costly we are and all that. So in that sense, it is the same exit criteria and this is how the polls support that. Now, the next stage is exactly to do exactly like you guys are doing, use those type of high quality French data and literally uh, understand what happened in real life. And then we can go back and evaluate our model. Okay, you know, how well, how well did the model do this? Can, can we really have this model as a useful, you know, part of the toolkit for the policymakers? On your second question, the IO network. Okay, IO network does amplify. So you are exactly, your intuition is exactly right on that. And in fact, in emerging market results, I didn't show you the detailed result, and emerging market re results, the amplification always dominates because emerging markets are so linked in the global IO net pro trade and production network, and they are actually very niche focused in, in certain sectors. So as long as price adjustment comes after, there is going to be this first round effect, a lot of on the amplification side, and then the price can, you know, smooth or amplify depending on that sector's position and, and all, 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 all those things and how important that sector in that emerging markets output. Now, this is also there for advanced economies. It, I'm not saying it isn't, but that extensive margin effect helps a lot because policy is just so big. The, the policy package is just so big in advanced economies. I didn't show you this figure, but we are talking about almost 18, 20% of GDP in advanced economies versus 5% of GDP in emerging markets. So in advanced economies, there are extensive margins. So when, when, the, when the firm exits, right? But there is also, there's at the same time policy support. So demand is normalizing. So you are, the policy is helping that relocation. So now that demand is like shift to the other sector. So that helps a lot to that amplification thing. So, uh, so amplification in terms of making the failures worse, even with the policy is there in emerging markets, but in advanced economies, it is contracted with this uh, extensive margin where, you know, the policy successfully reallocates demand uh, across that. And that's exactly the Chinese in supply shock argument, right? Chinese in supply shock did this demand constraint, but then fiscal policy came, shine and uh, night armor and solve that problem, right? And that's exactly why we see these differences. Fiscal policy is helping a lot, to the recovery in advanced economies, but not that much uh, in, in emerging markets. Okay, Carolina's question, type definitely matters. So uh, as, as Juan said, I mean, the fiscal policy worked, but it was expensive, right? So it was inefficient, not targeted. A lot of money went to the firms who didn't need it. And it, it, I mean, again, expensive work, we have to be a little bit careful because we are looking at disbursement. We, we don't recalculate the funds coming back, payments back. But still, it is it is inefficient. So when we look at different types, it is actually exactly as you said. So what what did work better is these equity like injections. When you you know if you this is again done in the model sense because we have to see what happened in real life. But you claw back some of that uh, money with excess profit tax and all that, or a cash grant if you uh, keep the employment conditional because then you keep the employment right. You don't have this unemployment problem. So. We kind of try to have an equal look in terms of when we say success, firms and jobs. So we put a lot of emphasis on the jobs too, right? So uh, yes, maybe you are you are doing this base, you are spending money, but if you are keeping your job, that's that's a success. We do, we did care a lot about jobs during this crisis. So in that sense, you know, giving a cash grant or uh, on conditional employment, taking some of the money back, an equity-like injection, obviously better than just in a pandemic loan, because pandemic loan is also, it depends on your banking system. It is going to work through the banking system, and that's going to depend on a lot of factors, how much of the risk government is take on itself, you know, what is the banking firm relationship there? So you are you're, you're exactly like that. And in fact, this is very funny, because I wrote one of the very early policy notes in April 2020 uh, for the US, uh, the title negative SME tax. I thought we don't have to get into any of the programs or the banks, just do through IRS. Do a negative tax now and you do a positive tax later on. Apparently, you know, nobody listened, but <laughs> now we find out that if you would have done that, 
we would have uh, actually avoided this huge increase on employment and it would have been a better policy. But anyway, so um, that, is, that is definitely important. And the final question in terms of systemic risk, I fully agree. I mean, remember the, that result, first of all, only for those countries, right? Uh, and there can be some sort of selection there. I mean, in general, I don't think we match better productive firms uh, and all that because the samples are representative. Um, but it can be that those countries we use, Belgium, Finland, all those countries with the data we use, can be firms are stronger in those countries. Um, I mean, the, the set ratios are European wide regulation, but, you know, uh, banks and firm linkages are so that, that uh, this is, you know, we are getting a better result. That, that can easily be. But this is something, by the way, I mean, you can do this for a, every country. We cannot because we don't have the data, but the policymakers do have the data. So this is a straightforward exercise to do. Uh, and I believe IMF did a more broader version of this exercise and they find a similar result. And it is about, I think, this high level of set ratios we start with. This is this is really the, the, the success of Basel and all those regulations. Uh, but you know, there can always be, be a selection issue there. I, I fully agree. Although I don't think that is in terms of firms, but more in terms of uh the, the countries uh with the data. So I mean obviously the result is going to be different in emerging markets, right? I mean, there is going to be definitely uh I, I think there is already systemic risk involved there. It's just that. Uh, we cannot measure it uh, as as good as with these countries we have today. Thank you so much for all the questions and comments, and let me know if I'm not here on any of my answers.